Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and bienvenue to a great spring. Talking about spring, we talk about transformation, new seasons, and new ideas. And tonight, we are very, very excited because we have the famous Lisa Perotti again on the show, you remember. Last time was July 5th. We talked about her life, her incredible background, being born in the US in the Northeast, moving to London as a theatrical actress and writer, evolving in the wine world, moving to Asia, fulfilling a dream, becoming a master of wine, and of course, naturally, heading the Wine Advocate magazine, continuing into the emperor footstep. And she's doing an amazing job. She's a clear, not only leader, but inspiration to all of you ladies and all of us at large in the wine world. She tastes phenomenally. And you all know that she is the best wine critique that the wine world has seen and combines masculine, feminine palette, whether there is such a thing, we'll talk about that too. And she wrote an incredible book, Taste Like a Wine Critic. So tonight, dear friends, Lisa accepted to come over to the house. We're going to have a great dinner following this great interview. And we're actually going to go through Lisa's brain, her mind, Lisa's idea of how she tastes. She's going to walk you through, and she's never done this. So this is a very big deal on how her mind functions, how her brain dictates what is being written on a wine, how she evaluates it, what she thinks of it. And she's going to go through every chapter. I have good news. She gave us an incredible opportunity to promote the book throughout all the properties and through tonight. So I read it, cover to back, back to cover. You must read it as well. It's a must. So dear friends, welcome to the fantastic. Woo and look at this. You see, the excitement gets me going. And now I've created a notion in front of us a notion of bubbles. Yeah, Lisa, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Welcome to Wapo Hill. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very honored. And Lisa, this is so exciting. Very nice. Isn't it? Bubbles from Burgundy. It is. It's a nice spring day. What more can you want? <laughs> what more can we want? So, Lisa, this is an incredible achievement. How did you decide to write this amazing book? Well, you know, I had recently taken over um, as an editor in chief of uh, Robert Parker Wine Advocate. And, you know, I wanted to get all of the stuff that was going on in my head and also all of the study material that I had left over from doing my Master of Wine studies. And I wanted to sort of get it all down on paper um, because I did have a lot of people asking me, you know, of course. what do you look for when you look at wine quality? And really, I mean, the book title is maybe a little bit provocative saying tastes like a wine critic. And, yes. and you know, it, it might put some people off thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to taste like a wine critic. I don't want to be that analytical. But actually, it's a good thing because, you know, you go beyond that stage of being overly analytical about yes. wine. And you almost, you know, find your passion for it again um, when you get to my stage, which is, uh, you know, 25 plus years into, you know, dealing and working with wine and, and tasting wine and studying wine. And you're still passionate about it. I am. I you am. open those boxes, I know, in your house right now during this COVID era, and you line them up and you still every morning. love dying into, diving into it. Yeah, every morning. Uh, it's, it's the, you know, it's the first thing I do actually. I'm a much better taster in the morning. My, my brain's much sharper. And so, yes, I have every morning already lined up on my tasting table, the, the day's wines that are going to be looked at. And then the great thing about, you know, uh, <laughs> tasting in the time of COVID um, is that we are all locked down. We're all, you know, I'm receiving all the samples at home. I open them up, but, Normally, a lot of my tastings, I would be, you know, going from winery to winery and tasting yes. the wines. And you don't actually have a lot of time to spend with those wines yes. when you're looking at them. 
because you, you obviously you've got you know boom 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 visit after visit after visit um but now you know i actually can spend a lot of time with each bottle and what is taking time with wine because the time is essential one on the wine to open up and to be ready to mm -hmm. be enjoyed and two to evaluate the wine give us your perception of and your perspective on that well, you know, it's it's really about there's an immediacy to wine. I mean, and this is why you know we can we can boom sit down in front of the wine and be able to analyze it and, and to say you know this is this is what it is and this is what it tastes like. Describe it accurately for people and then give it a rating. Um, but when you have a little bit more time to spend with the wine, then you can actually see you know how it's evolving. Mm -hmm. What it see it fan out a little bit more, enjoy it with some food That's right. in the evening and see how food compatible it is. So it, it kind of gives you another element, you know, you get to sort of know that wine. The other thing that you can do, of course, is, you know, often I don't get the opportunity to taste great wines side by side when you're visiting wineries and only tasting certain wines within wineries. Um, so to, to have that opportunity is not so much about, you know, being able to, to you know, better give it a, a ranking or a rating. Yes. But to more accurately describe why it is different from that, maybe their next door neighbor or another wine from that mm -hmm. region, one of its peers. And being able to describe that experience to a consumer who's never tasted the wine so that they understand what is the personality of that wine? What is its unique signature? Um, and and how is that experience going to be for me if I yes. buy that wine? So that's what it's really all about. So now, as you think of this book, mm -hmm. you went through the master of wine. Mm -hmm. Maybe just give our friends the process of this step in your life, because that was a big deal. Mm. You know, Lisa had been in the theater world, then buying wines, running a fabulous uh, pub, a wine bar in London, then moved to Asia. And then from there, you really did something quite amazing. You bought wine and then you realized you needed to go deeper. So explain us that mental process, which then led you to the book. Well, you know, it's funny because um, I'm, I'm quite a... a, a academic, I suppose. I love reading and studying and everything like that. So even in the early days when I was um, working, I began working in the wine trade in London, as you mentioned, and I was managing a wine bar. I, I happened to, to have come into the wine bar, this person who had an MW after their name. And so, you know, I had to know what that is. And they, you know, they were telling me about master of wine and what it means, you know. It was not the title of the queen, it was master of wine, and which is maybe as important. <laughs> Maybe in the wine world or wine circles, um, certain wine circles. But, you know, I, I, had, I thought, you know, about this qualification and, you know, it being at the pinnacle of yes. wine studies. And I thought, well, you know, that is something that I definitely want to do as, as a personal journey more than anything. That's and right. I, I always say to people who are thinking about emba embarking on the Master of Wine, don't do it because you think you're going to get a better job or you're going to get more money, you know, and maybe those things will come along. But, you know, it's it's so difficult and the pass rate is so low that really there can't be any other reason than for your own personal challenge, you know, to sort of give yourself that challenge and say, you know, like running a, a marathon. or That's something. right. I, I want. So to you this. started it for yourself. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And did you give yourself, talking about time, a timeline to accomplish it? Did you say maybe five years? Because dear friends, as you know, many don't pass. There's only 300 more or less masters of wine around the planet at this stage from all over the world. And a lot of great ladies that you've inspired. Congratulations for that. Because <laughs> it's very cool to see so many talented ladies. And did you put yourself goals and dates when you said that um i mean you do you're kind of given a time limit from from when you start the whole process um and especially nowadays and you're only given so many chances to sit the exam you're only given so many years within yes. to sit it so you're kind of given you know constraints anyway because basically 
they, I hate to say it, they weed you out very quickly if you're, you're not the material that's going to get through. They don't want Sorry. you sort of hanging on for 20 years being a master of wine student. Um, so you're, you're kind of given those constraints anyway. That said, I did have a baby. <laughs> she means in a nice way they keep the hell out of you and they say, out! <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, but I did have a baby um, just after I, I passed the tasting part wow. of the exam. Um, and so I, I got to take a year off, I guess. So you were still <laughs> pregnant and you passed the test? Yes. That's yeah. Well, no, I wasn't pregnant during the test. It, yeah. I got pregnant just after passing that part of the exam. And then I was going to go on and do the theory and the, the dissertation, which is what they had back in those days. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I did get an extra year in there um, because I, I, I took a year off. I, I was um, basically going to have the baby. I had, well, I had the baby in, in um, the end of May and the, the <laughs> exam is the first week of June. So that just wow. wasn't going to work. Um, um, Maybe on the medical table. Yes. I'm yeah. sure you would have passed out. Uh, well, you know, I was sorely tempted because I was so in the zone yeah. right then. And, and it, do you feel as I've heard that from my mother uh -huh. and other wonderful ladies in wine that your taste could get sharper and sharper as you, you pregnant and you're on the verge of delivering or just after, is it true? It's a really good question. You know, it, it, it is true. Your palate changes. Um, and I was working, I worked all the way through both of my pregnancies um, uh, uh, as a, let's see, when, when I had my first, I was a buyer for, yeah. for a wine importer. And uh, with the second, I was already, I was working for a Robert Parker wine advocate. Um, so yeah, I worked straight through those. Um, now what, what I found was um, not so much that, you know, obviously everybody loves a heightened sense of smell, um, and that's a wonderful thing to have, but it's really the heightened sense of um, acidity and bitterness I see. Um, that I really needed to sort of calibrate for. So I would calibrate with like a known entity, a known wine, mm -hmm. um, to make sure I wasn't over judging, for example. So you used the wine you knew well as a benchmark. Yeah, words. yeah. I would every single day when I started, I would use a, a wine that I knew well to, to help calibrate my palate to make sure I wasn't overstating the acidity or overstating maybe the tannins or under slightly underripe tannins and, and all of that because those things can come across as like really exaggerated ah. um, uh, or at least that was my experience for I'm sure. sure every single woman goes through a different experience but for me there was that was that that heightened sense of acidity and bitterness in but particular I'm, I'm so glad that you use that as a check and balance this is great yeah. yeah yeah and then so you capture all your wonderful notes and you said to yourself I should share them and that was the birth of this baby. <laughs> it was. There was a lot of research that went into um, doing the Master of Wine. And some of it went into there, but also a lot of things that I just, I wanted to get down on paper because, you know, uh, for the first time, I was not just being a critic myself, but I was looking after a team of critics yes. as well. And I wanted to be able to communicate to them eloquently, mm. you know, all of these elements that I thought were, were part of being, you know, a, a great wine critic, things that you, you so they have to read it before they join. The I team. gave them copies of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure they do. So dear friends, I went through the book both ways and very kindly Lisa offered it to me just as a gift, um, you know, last year when we saw each other and I adored it then, and then I went back into it a few days ago to make sure I was really aligned. And, and there's one sentence that I adore, and we're gonna go through the chapters and Lisa will guide us through them. So it's one of a kind experience we're having. And I love how you open. Are we on the same smelling page? This is brilliant as an expression. So. Do you want to walk us through that and what yeah. you mean? Because this is how the book starts. So dear friend, when you're going to have it, as I know you will, you won't <laughs> be able to, to hold it back. Yeah. I mean, you know, I thought before, you know, we even opened a discussion about what you t talk about when you talk about wine quality. Yes. Um, you have to, first of all, you know, mention to people that we are not all on the same smell page. That's right. Um, that our noses and our, our palates or our tongues are actually unique. 
Um, and although we can you know, communicate in a similar way to discuss wines, um, we need to, to realize that we're all not getting exactly the same experience when we smell or taste a wine. Um, for example, there's a, if, if you imagine, you know, you can, you can um, detect over a, different, a billion different molecules, yes. different scents with your, your nose, um, at, of which there were probably 800 in a glass of wine. 800 different kinds. Yeah, there can be up to 800 different smells in a glass of wine. And uh, now, not all of those are going to be, you know, discernible to you. Some of them are just so very faint that you're yes. not going to be able to sort of say, oh, that's that and that. But, you know, what you're really looking for are the major ones that stand out to you, that leap out to you. And hopefully, you know, when you're communicating that experience, it'll be a relatively similar experience That's for right. a lot of people. But we do know that, that you know, there are, are certain people who are had what we call asnos asnosmia, um, which is they, they have an inability to smell That's certain right. molecules, to pick them up. Um, things like TCA, trichloral anisole, um, yes. or, or corked wine. Um, things like rotundone. Mm -hmm. um, which is that, that black pepper smell that you get in Shiraz's. Um, people, there are people out there who can't detect I those see. smells. And, and for them, you know, they're going to have a slightly different wine experience for sure. than perhaps, you know, people who, who are very sensitive to those. And even, you know, if you can pick up smells, there are different intensities of those smells um, that are available to you compared to me, for example. That's right. Um, so that you might, might pick something up as being very intense in this glass, whereas I get it as a, a relatively weak aroma. So we're all different. We're all different. We're all and different. that's important. As much as you love reading Lisa's reviews, we don't always have to agree. So dear friends, I just want to say wine is always a lesson of humility, and this is why I love to taste with Lisa, and I, when we personally can do it, I love as well to hear her comments and I analyze them because it's phenomenal to be able to transcribe into words what she feels and smell and sense and, and how to compare notes. So I think it's a lesson of humility. Often I say the more we taste, the less <laughs> we know. So I love so much that expression that, Lisa, if you agree, I would love for you to take one, yeah, the first Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So dear friends, we're tasting number 49. And I did not give any preview on any wine to Lisa. And purposely, I don't think she's ever tasted those wines. So the fun part is, it's a live surprise right now. And she's gonna tell us, you know, are we on the same smell page? And show <laughs> us the distinction because isn't smelling an enormous part of Wine tasting. It is. Um, obviously, you can smell a lot more than you can taste. You yes. know, as I said, it's 800 to, compared to, what, six, six different tastes that you have. Um, and, and not all of those really as important uh, on the palate. Um, so, yes, I mean, smell is incredibly important. Um, it's going to bring to life, really, yep. on your palate um, when you mix together the sensation of smell and yes. the sensation of taste through what we call retronasal olfaction. Um, so actually, if you've ever slurped some soup, for example, yes. um, and in the book I use the example of ramen, you know, because I was yes. like, living in Japan, and you, you watch um, Japanese people tasting, or, or you know, they're really tasting the ramen yeah. by slurping it. Now, obviously, it cools it down on the palate, but it also makes you taste even more strongly um, the flavors coming out of the soup, the broth itself. And that's because they're bringing in yes. air aroma, which volatizes all of those aroma compounds and makes them accessible to your palate. I see. Um, so you're actually tasting more, and, and you, if you see real wine dorks swirling their glass, first of all, getting some air going in the glass, and then bringing in some air like that, they're, they're kind of slurping it on the palate. I try to do it because I, I, I get a little bit conscious oh, of it there. Sure. You know, I love the noise of it. You're in a public place, but you get the slurping going on the palate 
And then what you get is at the back of the palate, there's a mixing in your brain between the flavors that you can taste on your tongue and those that you can smell um, yes. with your nose at the back of the palate. And that's where you really get that, that real so sensation. So we refer to retro olfaction yeah. as an example. So explain our friends how it works. Mm -hmm. And I love as well your expression. Dear friends, variable one, I'm reading the book. <laughs> we do not all smell and taste with identical equipment. And I love this expression, noses or tongues. So walk us through retro olfaction and then that sentence, because I think then you'll see in the book this incredible picture of the tongue that looks similar. We may have the same tongue, <laughs> but we don't look at it the same way. Yeah, I mean, we, we have, you know, relatively the same taste buds on, on our, our tongue, um, but some of us have denser taste buds. That's right. Um, we call them super tasters that have like, more densely packed taste buds on the tongue. And that really just means, it doesn't mean a lot. It doesn't mean you're necessarily a better taster. And in some ways we say, you know, it's, it's not even preferable to be a super taster with those really dense taste buds because you're not normal. You're almost a freak. It means that you're tasting things like bitterness, like to yes. the extreme. And, and that means what you really want to do, and again, it's a matter of kind of calibrating your palate if you are a super taster, um, because if you want to describe the experience to the bulk of the planet, um, you basically have to sort of tone down your assessment yes. of things like bitterness. Um, otherwise, what you're picking up is not what most people are picking up. That's um, it. Uh, and, you know, the same with smell. Um, if you, you need to know as a critic um, or, or somebody who's communicating about wine what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. Yes. Are there things out there that are very common to wine that you can't smell? Because if that is the case, then you need to sort of be like able... Like what as an example? Well, uh, like the examples I, I just gave, like um, trichloral anisole, like corked wine. Now, that's, that's a big no-no almost, because you really, really must be able to tell um, what a corked uh, glass of wine smells or tastes like if you're, you're a critic. Um, and the reason being is because... At very low levels of TCA, um, even even if you, you're you're not getting the experience of that, it, it kind of scalps the wine. It That's robs right. you. It, it mutes it down. It, it dumbs everything else down. So if you don't know that that's because of the TCA, then you're just judging that wine based on that. And so, it, it, for me, I think it's a very important thing to be able to pick up as a yes. critic. For sure. Um, because then you straight away know, oh, there's something wrong with this one. I need another sample. I can't possibly judge it from That's this right. alone. I'm, I'm in full agreement. So let's do it together. So dear friends, you are watching Lisa evaluating the wine. And I feel very excited because life is about learning at all times. So I'm learning. <laughs> Well, you know, when you're, you're describing um, to a consumer, when you're writing a tasting note, yes. it's going to be read by a lot of people who may or may not want to buy that, that wine. Really what you're looking for are the major aromas that leap yeah. out in there that you know that most people are going to be able to pick up so that you can describe what the general experience is going to be for somebody else who's never experienced the wine. So let's do it on... This number 49, which is actually coming from Sonoma mm -hmm. in this instance. So it's a Chardonnay, dear friends, from the JCB collection that is number 49. You know, meaning when 1849, the famous gold <laughs> rush and all that. So what do we smell? Well, I think if you want to start, you know, by, by describing the taste experience, um, first of all, you have to say, is it, you know, a really sort of dull kind of weak or delicate yes. smell? Or is it leaping from the glass? Is I it see. bursting from the glass? And that, that's So you evaluate the, the intensity? Yes, okay. yes. Um, and, and I try to do it in, in kind of fun terms that kind of bring right. a personality to the wine as well. Because you can be, you know, overly analytical about these things. And, you know, 
put people to sleep reading the tasting sure. notes. Yeah. You really want to capture well, the Well, luckily you don't. And that's maybe your theatrical background as a writer as uh, well, who knows how to capture the attention yeah. through the words. It's important. It's important. So, you know, and, and the first thing, you know, I, I get when I, I put my nose in this glass is that, boom, it really does yeah. leap from the glass. It sings, it, you know, bursts, you know, however you want to describe that personality, but it's really very, you know, flashy, alive. showy. Yeah, it's alive. It's yeah. intense. Um, and then, you know, there's the actual descriptors. What does it smell like? Okay. Because, you know, a lot of people think we make these up as we go along. That's you know, right. we just start randomly throwing, you know, Chardonnay descriptors out there, you know. And, yeah. But for me, when I'm reading a really good tasting note that's written by a professional, every single one of those descriptors means something to me. So, you know, with, with Chardonnay, for example, you can have tropical fruit yes. at the riper end of the spectrum. Yes. You know, you've got pineapples, passion fruit, guava. And for me, straight away when I hear that in the tasting note, I, I, it tells me this is a riper style of Chardonnay. Or you can, at the other end of the spectrum, get the citrusy notes, the lemon, the That's lime right. blossom, the orange blossoms, all of that. And then somewhere in between, you've got the stone fruits, what I call them, the apricots, the peaches, the, the yes. white peach, if it's a more delicate expression, all of these things. So, you know, for me, and what I really like in a great Chardonnay is, great. It, is if it Guidance. mixes it up a bit, Yes, and, you know, and this is what, if I'm getting too geeky here, just stop me. But this is what I love about this, this clone we have here in California in particular called the Wente clone. Because if you ever see a bunch of it, it, um, uh, it, it's got what, what we call hens and chicks. Um, it's got big berries and it's got little tiny berries that look like we call, what the, the winemakers call them shot berries. Yes. Um, that they haven't fully developed. But what it is, is you've got ripeness across a, a vast spectrum. So you've got really ripe, juicy grapes, the bigger sized ones, and you've got more sort of delicate, citrusy, minerally grapes at the, the, the tinier end of the spectrum. Ah. And it brings what I call layers of aromas and also flavors onto the palate. And so this is what kind of what I'm seeing with this wine. Yes. Um, I'm seeing this sort of citrusy, I've got some stone fruit, maybe just a touch of tropical in there, you know? And so, like I said, each one of these descriptors means something about the ripeness. I love it. That we've got going on here. Well, thank you. This is what a guidance. Ooh, aren't we lucky, dear friends? And then you can pick this up. This is live. <laughs> you can pick up just a little bit of the winemaking yes. as well. So you get a little bit of that sort of diacetyl or, or butteriness from mm -hmm. malolactic fermentation. You get a little bit of the um, uh, cedary character from a, some some time in new oak. Um, and all of these are subtle. So you, you kind of have to be careful how you describe them as well. And we meant them to be subtle. So I'm delighted, in fact, that the intention is in the glass. And mm -hmm. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to show page 30, an incredible <laughs> graph. So here it is. If you could layer that in your explanation, the wine purposes pyramid. And I thought this was very well done. This is the first time I really see it from sense to awareness to knowledge. And then the involvement and you know, the expectations. Could you describe this as you lay? Yeah, this? you know, that's really talking about what quality is, you know, and, and there is a chapter on that, what we yes. mean, because it's a very philosophical question. Really. That's right. What, what is quality um, and what is, you know, fit for purpose um, versus, you know, going into these, you know, other realms that are, are really more akin to art. That's you know, it. And art. very abstract and very subjective in many ways, right? Yes. Or could be. So, uh, you know, when, when we're a, a critic looking at wine quality, I mean, obviously you get some, some very well-made fit for purpose wines down at the lower end of that pyramid. Yes. You know, that, that are, are nicely balanced. And we go into the components that make up quality in there. You know, they don't have obviously any faults. Um, they're nicely balanced. They've got a liquid yeah. level intensity. They've got a, a nice long finish. All of these things. But, you know, maybe they're not particularly complex. Maybe That's they don't right. have the layers. And at the very upper end of that period, pyramid, maybe they don't have that real sense of place, that personality That's that it. actually 
transports you to where the wine came from, from that vintage, from that time, from that signature of the winemaker. So it's, it's where place and time and person come together. And intention equal person, which is very important. Mm. Um, so yes, that, that's really what it's about. The, the, the difference from looking at something that is, you know, a perfectly good glass of wine to something that elevates, you know, as, as though it were a cultural experience. Well said. So in terms of those two Chardonnays, we purposely... Let's have a look at this. One. And Lisa, again, has never tasted... Most likely those wines before, we're trying Sonoma and Napa. So two different areas, two different styles, known as different. Mm -hmm. So maybe you walk us through how you perceive the differences. and Yeah, uh, there, there's a real sort of bright cheeriness. You get some of that citrusy character in the Sonoma County one. Um, and a, a real sort of intensity. It's got like an energy to it, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Um, and whereas the Napa one is... So serious, isn't that, you know? And again, you, you try to describe the personalities of the wine because this is, you know, what I feel is going to come across to the person that drinks them. There's something a little bit richer, mm -hmm. something a little bit more sort of confident about the, the Napa Chardonnay. Um, maybe not so fun, maybe more serious That's it. there. Um, um, and I like that. There, there's a, a sort of oiliness yeah. to the texture of the Napa Chardonnay, which is kind of more satiny. Um, in the texture of the um, uh, Sonoma County one. And, you know, both are great wines. Thank you know, you. and I would say they're not far off in terms of quality when Thank you look you. at them. So what we're really looking at are stylistic differences. And, you know, let's say we gave both of them 95 points. Let's say. Yeah, let's say that they're both 95 points and a consumer is trying to decide which one they want. That's when it comes down to stylistic preferences. And for me, actually. Yes. It's much more important. You yes. know, when I'm reading a review of a wine that I'm shopping for, you see yes. what I'm saying? and I do all the time, I go, you know, to look at our, our reviewers, you know, tasting notes and scores. Yeah. Um, and I'm in a, you know, a supermarket or a wine shop and I'm looking at the wines going, okay, which one do I buy? They're the same price. And then, you know, I'm looking at them, they're the same score. Um, but you know what? Score doesn't even matter because what I'm really looking for is this kind of, minerally savory style, which is what I'm really in the mood for right yes. now. And that's what you're looking for in the descriptors. You want, there should be some key terms in there that leap out to you for the mood that you're in or your general, you know, stylistic preferences. The food preferences. may serve. Exactly, exactly. And that's why it's so important to get the tasting notes right. Yeah. Um, because for me, there oftentimes I've gone and bought a 90 point wine as opposed to a 95 point wine because yeah. that's the style i'm in the mood for that's so what here I bring when tonight. you were talking about style you see a a, a difference of course yes that's amazing oh yeah there's yeah. Th these are two very different styles of chardonnay even though you know obviously sonoma and napa are, are not very far away from it, a short that's drive right. from one another um but the the styles are very different here and i'm so glad you said that because my intention with Brian Manone and Stephanie Putnam, in this case, was to make two different wines. So you could taste the identity of Sonoma and then in Napa. So I'm so glad to hear this. And you've noticed, dear friends, what Lisa has done. She talked about general terms, satin, and then she used another term. But terms that we can all use. So don't feel intimidated in many ways because you don't necessarily know the appropriate technical terms. Lisa is making us feel very comfortable. And she writes, you know, the subjectivity of wine. And she tells you that we all able to describe wine as we wish to describe wine. Do you want to go on that as well? Because well, you make us feel comfortable. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. You know, I need to, um, and I'm constantly learning and striving myself to speak in universal terms yes, uh, and not only speak in universal terms, but when I say something is citrusy and when I say something is tropical, um, I need to use those terms with consistency. Yes. Um, and that, that's probably the most important thing. You know, you can have your own terms for wines, but as you build up your tasting note library, when you, you are talking to friends, 
What they're going to be looking for as well is that you apply certain terms with consistency. When you say medium bodied or full bodied, yes. this is what you mean versus that, you know, and, and you're not using those terms randomly so that they don't mean something. You know, if we were to look at these wines, I would say that the, the Napa is yes. a fuller bodied style. It's That's a right. richer wine. Um, uh, and the Sonoma wine is more of a medium to medium full bodied, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhere in between, but it's definitely a lighter bodied style than That's the right. Napa one. And, you know, making sure that when you describe it in a, a tasting note, that's going to be not seen comparing these two, every tasting note we have to write, we have to write as if it's going to be read in isolation. Um, so that Which it, makes sense because absolutely. you're in front of that shelf, as you describe, boom, I want to see what Lisa thinks. You yep. go on the wineadvocate.com website and bang, you read Lisa and you're alone. Yep. You're not comparing it. So, yep. Yep. So that's, that's how it works. I mean, really, you just need to, to be able to very clearly describe those differences and apply yeah. those descriptions with accuracy and with consistency. Big job, dear friend. When you think <laughs> it's easy, ooh la la. So Lisa, maybe briefly, there's two chapters that I think are very, very important. And you touched on it, but quickly, what is wine quality? Mm -hmm. and wine folds briefly <laughs> because not easy to decipher mm -hmm. you mentioned a cork flavor within the wines you've mentioned other elements of wine that are not desirable and then what is wine quality well let's start with the wine quality because that's the chapter that i start out with you yeah. know and and there's a difference between what Fine quality means to you personally, and again, when we're talking in, in the universal spectrum, and that's really, it's a, it's a chapter that people have said to me, oh, you know, it's a little bit confusing, and you could have left it out, but I think if you're actually going to, to um, talk about wine quality, you need to uh, make people understand that quality exists on many different levels, and that's why I did the pyramid. Yes. Um, for many people, the fit for purpose is, is as far as they want to go with quality. Mm -hmm. But, you know, obviously if you're really got the wine bug and you're getting into collecting and you want wine to be that other, you know, upper level experience at the top of the pyramid, you know, the, as I said, where it's akin to art, where it brings a culture to you, um, then you need to, um, uh, be able to describe wine within that context. That's right. Um, so basically that's what we do at Robert Parker Wine Advocate. Um, we look at wine um, from the tippy top. Yes. And then, you know, everything has to be encompassed within that context. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have what we call a peer group, for mm -hmm. example, and you're looking at wine where it sits amongst its peer group, Um, if you're only looking at, you know, I really just want the fit for purpose, good quality wine for under $25, <laughs> um, then, then, you know, that's fine. That's your peer that's group fine. that yeah. you're looking at. Yeah. Our peer group gets much bigger. Yes. Yeah. First of all, we don't take into account price. Um, it's not one of the factors. Which I'm so excited about. Yeah. Because that's a big statement, dear friends. Irrelevant of price, you could read the review. Yeah. So we, we don't take into account price, but also we are, we have to consider the world of wine, you know, and, and that's, you know, one of my jobs as, as editor in chief as well as we, we now have 10 critics and making sure that everybody is on the same page. Yes. When we talk about, for example, a 95 point experience, a 90 point experience, 85 point experience or a hundred point experience. That's right. You know. So you have to look at it in the context of the world yes. and all the wines from top to bottom um, when you're, you're evaluating a Chardonnay. Of course, yes. you know, there's, there's Chardonnays made just about everywhere on the planet that makes wine. That's it. Um, so you're, you're seeing it in, in a grand picture. Um, when I look at, you know, a Sonoma County Chardonnay and I say, oh, that's 95 points yeah. it needs to be able to stand up against one from burgundy that's 95 Absolutely. points and the quality needs and to how, be right there forgive me for the interruption but how do you do that because lisa dear friends run the whole wine advocate program so she has many wine 
and phenomenal wine tasters around the world. It could be Australia, it could be New Zealand, it's Europe, it's South America. So when you look at the global and you approve the final process, how do you take that into account, knowing that you haven't tasted every wine there is? Well, um, yeah, the, that has to do with building up a very substantial mental wine library. Yes. Um, if you want to be a critic, you have to have tasted a lot of wines. You can't just, you know, sort of walk in and go, you know, uh, I, I've, had, I've had a white and I've had a red and I've had a rosé. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> no, you have to have tasted tens of thousands, if not, you know, hundreds of thousands. Which of you wines. have, not only that as a buyer, but then obviously with a wine advocate. And, and by the way, how many wines a year do you taste? Oh, you know, I don't know. I, 15, I review. 15,000 probably? Probably, well, probably around 10 that I taste. Wow. But that said, I only review around three to 4,000, so. Only? Yeah, <laughs> so not everything gets a review, not everything. And then your overall Wine Advocate uh, magazine, how many total do you We review? do 30,000 a year, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, our goal. yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's so we're, we're all, you know, um, uh, between three and 4,000 yeah. wines as a, as a full-time reviewer. So as you say, wine quality, one of the sentence I adore that you say here, this is not because quality is so mysterious, but because quality is so simple, immediate and direct. I love that sentence. Can you explain? Well, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was a quote by Robert Persig, yeah, from um, uh, the um, Zen that's and right. the Art of wa Motorcycle Maintenance when he talks about quality. Because, you know, that's a, it's a book, it's a, it's a bit of um, a, a journey, you know, looking at what quality is. Um, but I think that that's an important quote to bring out because, yes, in, in one aspect, quality should be something immediately recognizable. Yes. Um, that said, we also have to pull it apart yes. when we're doing the tasting note because people need to be convinced one way or the other. That's right. You know, um, on the quality part. So your tasting note is not just a description of the wine either, but it also validates the score that you've given. Mm -hmm. um, it's really just um, talking about, you know, what, why this wine is, deserves 100 points or 95 points or why it's getting 85, 80, maybe less. <laughs> That's right, which happens. Yes, which happens. So. And dear friends, I endorse the world we're in. The world is about competition, but it's about different palettes and being check and balance by the people you respect. So I love the fact that we as winemakers and stylists in the world of wine are always challenged by a third party who would neutrally taste the wines. And I think it's very, very important, whether it's a fashion show you're doing, whether it's a jewelry series, whether it's a fragrance you're making or wine, that someone tells you I like or I don't like, and that's the reason why, and I think it's important. Don't you mm -hmm. think? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we're, we're really there um, for the consumer, basically. We taste thousands of wines, as I've already said, so that they don't have to. We, yes. As I like to say, we kiss a lot of frogs so that the, <laughs> the consumer doesn't have to. And, and we find, you know, a prince or two. That's it. Um, that, that's really what we do. And, and to describe the experience so that they're not buying a bottle of wine that's not to their stylistic preference. So there's another, and wine fault, I think everybody will get it well in the book obviously mm -hmm. you know there's but the, the important point about the chapter and it's probably a, a too long a chapter on on wine faults is that you know all wines have faults that's right all wines have a certain degree of faults all wines have volatile acidity now yeah. most of it's below the detection threshold so you'll never pick up i should say volatile acidity is just that sort of vinegary smell mm -hmm. um, that is a byproduct of fermentation of, of making the wine um, so it's naturally existent in the the wine yes um in very small doses it, it gives a little brightness it gives a little lift to the wine like putting you know a little bit of vinegar in a beurre blanc that's right you know it gives that richness a little bit of lift and we see that with Sauterne. Sauterne right. has a, a little bit of an elevated level of VA huh. compared 
compared to other styles of wines. But here you've got a very rich, sweet wine that almost needs that, you know, that little tart bit of acid in there to give it a little kick. I see. Um, and, and it works beautifully in styles like that. In a, you know, a, a beautiful, pristine, dry white wine like these, obviously you don't Thank want you. to see any VA, do you? No. Um, but, you know, most wines, and I, you know, I, I taste a lot of, of, of wines that have maybe a little bit of Britannomyces. Mm -hmm. um, when it's in the background there, when it's giving a little bit of, you know. Hard I, to detect. Yeah, huh? when it's hard to detect. Then, you know, oxidation is a big enemy, right? Oxidation, yes. That's um, a and you describe it so well here, the oxidation and the characters of it or what you should detect. I mean, in yeah. that page, I think you do a fabulous job mm -hmm. really giving guidance to it. Another one maybe just to touch on is reduction, which yeah. is sometimes difficult. Sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. Reduction is, is a yeah. tricky one. And it's one that, you know, I used to, to uh, run into a lot in Burgundy in particular. Of course. Your, your stomping ground. Um, uh, wines, in fact, a lot of winemakers have the philosophy that they want to keep the wine reduced while it's in barrel for as long as possible. Absolutely. Um, because it comes... It, reduction, I should say, is the opposite of oxidation. It's when a wine has shut down um, because it, it hasn't been exposed to any oxygen. And then some of the compounds in there change. They transform right. into um, either hydrogen sulfide or mercaptans um, and all of these very complex notes that you get in there. Now, when you first smell a wine that, that's got a case of reduction, it might smell a little bit rubbery. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the most classic one. But, you know, Reduction can, can manifest itself in all sorts of different ways. I mean, you get like a lifted raspberry character mm. sometimes. Um, you know, you get this sort of tarry character that's kind of a little bit like a terroir character, um, we, we like to say, but probably is just reduction. <laughs> <laughs> we escape in the terroir as an excuse. Yes. And I agree with you. We use that as an ersatz. Yes. You know, in German, it means the escape. And we find those words, oh, it's terroir. Yeah. <laughs> For two words, it's an excuse because yeah. we may have made a mistake in winemaking too. Yeah. You see how Lisa makes it so simple. I mean, and I don't mean to say that in a, obviously in a very positive way, I say it, to understand how. So in this book, you will really uh, understand as well the superficial faults as well, which mm -hmm. I think you describe in two pages that I love, mm. that comes from the protein of the wine, some of the lees agings oh uh, the, the most common one is probably the tartrate That's crystals it. when you've got you know tartrates that have come out of solution um uh, particularly with a white wine so for example if you've got a great white burgundy or a, a chardonnay like one of these um the wine has not been cold stabilized um and you uh um it gets exposed to colder temperatures and then all of a sudden, the um, tartrates that were in solution come out of solution and they form crystals in the bottle. Like those. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they are the bottom of the bottle. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I see them a lot, yeah. a lot. You even see them in red time sometimes, but the tannins inhibit the formation of, of tartrate crystals more so than in white wines um, and to a certain degree. But if you get those little crystals, it really is just a superficial um, fault, I would say. You know, it it's, can be kind of scary to see if you think, oh, I've got some broken glass in there or something. It's not, it's just, it's no different than, for example, a salt crystal or a, That's right. a sugar crystal or something like that. And you can eat them. They're, they're, you know, perfectly healthy. They're just tartaric acid and natural. Um, it's uh, actually good for you. Maybe. It is. Yeah. It's a natural byproduct of grapes, basically. Um, they, they, yeah. are, they have tartaric acid in them and, and that's all it is. So yes, it goes into some superficial yeah. faults like that. But I think it's great because then if you really want to get into it, take notes, which I did. I learned a great deal and we only at page 50, dear friends, but I wanted to bring a little surprise for Lisa, something she has no <laughs> clue of what it is. It's actually in this decanter, the passion collection decanter and I brought a wine she doesn't know at all what it is she hasn't tasted it and the purpose of this is to have a great time with the very best most phenomenal wine critique on the planet today so Lisa is this it oh that no no this is yours oh, this is mine. but you can take mine oh, okay. <laughs> 
Cheers. So this is attention. full surprise. And I think we, we got to let Lisa show us really how she does it. So Lisa, whatever goes in your brain, if you would be so kind, and if you don't like it, or if you think whatever, tell us, it doesn't matter. I'll unveil it. And I purposely chose one of our wines, so if something dramatic happened, I'm the only one to blame. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's nice. Um, so straight away, it's, it's Pinot Noir. Yes. Um, it's, it's got obviously got the fruit characters of, of Pinot Noir, um, the sort of cranberries and raspberries and, and um, cherries and, and all of those things. So dear friends, I'm going to just make comments each time. 100% so far. That's it. <laughs> well, but it's, you know, keep going on why Pinot so everybody can just... But, you yeah, know, well, the other thing is that perfume, it's got the floral perfume to it. It's got the pale color. Yep. Um, it's got, um, the, the other thing I picked up straight away on the nose is stems. Um, yes. Yeah, so there's some stems that have gone into there. Um, and she <laughs> had no clue of what we're tasting. Could have been a Cab, it could have been a Shiraz, it could have been a Tempranillo. I... I'm absolutely not guiding anything, but you could see, how did you decipher the stem? This is brilliant. Uh, well, the stems is, it, it's... Uh, because it, it's it, true. It's really hard, yeah, it's really hard to sort of tell people yeah. what stems smell like, because they smell like stems to me. Um, but it's a slightly herbal character that does not come from underripe grapes. Um, so there, there's another character, another herbal character that you get from underripe grapes known as pyrazines. But it's not pyrazines. Right. It's no. a slightly sort of herbal character, but it's a savoriness. And, and what I find that uh, although um, tannins, uh, stems are usually used with Pinot Noir to contribute to the backbone of the wine to give it a little bit more tannic yeah. structure um, in order to give it some more aging potential. The other beautiful thing that they do is they sort of tone down the yes. fruit and bring about a kind of savory character to the wine that I Maybe really she's like. going to become a winemaker next time. <laughs> but I love this very true, and what Lisa just mentioned is important as well because that natural characteristics, herbaceousness, woodiness comes naturally from the fruit itself, from the stem of the fruit, not just the barrel. And that's how you get this. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've been very big in Burgundy and now in Sonoma, Russian River to do whole cluster fermentation that she's identified. And I would tell you, I give her 100% again. It's true. That's how we made this wine. It's difficult, though, because beyond that, um, it's, uh, you know, uh, one of my worst things when I'm doing blind tastings is trying to second guess the host. Yes. So I know you're from Burgundy. Yes. And I know you make wines here in California. <laughs> And so I'm like, oh, is she okay. gonna play with her this, mind? It could be either mind. Burgundy or it could be, you know, Sonoma. It, you know, the mind boggles. Um, and and you know, when I taste this wine, it's it's really weird because I can I can see Burgundy in it. I can see you know Sonoma in it. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's Maybe got I like a trick the best of these? both worlds. Well, is it your thinking? I don't know. Both are here. She's looking at me with decided eyes. You, I hate to you say. You wouldn't. She's actually right. <laughs> How did you guess? You're terrible. We've never tasted this wine together. <laughs> and I'm playing literally for all of us for really the fun good. of it. With, <laughs> thank you. And this is amazing because this is a wine that is exactly bringing both worlds together. Why did you say that? And... How did you guess it? Well, because this is fully brilliant, dear friends. You are sharing the experience. We live. I'm having goosebumps. This is so cool <laughs> because that shows you the level of skills. Well, there's there's a couple of things. First of all, there's a, a a weightiness, a generosity that you really only get in like a very warm vintage of Burgundy, say 2003. But you know that you, you don't get this caliber of fruit. Yes. there either and so that that kind of takes me to to sonoma that sort of sunshine that's, that's apparent in the glass the, that's exuberance of fruit yeah i agree with you but then you have like a minerality to the wine um yeah. that you've got that that sort of you know restraint um as well to the wine um that that you know is is you know it couldn't be anything else than burgundy wow <sighs> i need to breathe in 
pretty impressive. It's nice. Friends. You know what? I, I Do you like the style? I love it. I love it. I I am a closet blender at home. I love to at the end of the day when really? I'm tasting lots of wines. I love to say, ooh, what would it be like if I took a little bit of this wine and put a little bit of the white wine and brought them together. And I know it's bad. No, <laughs> it's awesome. But I do like to sort of just I'm discovering see another side of Lisa. I know, I know. Which is brilliant, Lisa. I gotta tell you the story. Gina, my lovely wife, and our our wedding decided to create this wine because we thought we want every guest to eventually leave with a bottle. What can they leave from us? Yeah, it can't be yours and it can't be hers. <laughs> so we blended it and Gina was brilliant into adding in this wine number three, which is the three most important women in my life who are, besides my mother and sister, of course, <laughs> my lovely wife and daughters, and was really that marriage of both. So we blended. What do you think? Is it called de nuit or called de bone? So dear friends, the Grand Cru Top Guns or the rich, powerful, intense Pinot from the Côte de Bon? What do you oh, think? Oh, no. It's got to be Côte de Nuit. I know you'd use Côte de Nuit. This is <laughs> She's again does, right. It does have the power. I'm going to say women are always you. right, but I'm going to cheer to <laughs> Congratulation. This is very cool that you just, out of the blue, and this shows you you know, the idea of what one goes through in their mind. You live life. The only wine in the world made this way because we have both Burgundy and California and you saw live, Lisa guessing it, and Côte de Nuit. And why Côte de Nuit? Just the final question. Well, it's the, the power and the perfume and, and also the, the tannic structure there. Um, and that, that's another thing that would take me away from California as well. There's, there's a uh, a tannic structure wow. to wines from the Côte de Nuit um, that you just don't get in the Côte de Bone. That's right. And you, you, you just don't really get here in California either. Brilliant. I'm giving you a hundred point on this one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Dear friends, I need to reconstitute myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is impressive. I'm, uh, you know, there, there's only a group of two boys in France, Gina and I in a fabulous restaurant. We're doing a Domaine de la Vougeray Grand Cru tasting and we, in between, in front of Michel Bétan, who you know, and Bernard Burchy, isolate this wine. It was the first edition. And they guessed it. They said, you're fooling us. Gina is here. You're blending something unique <laughs> in here. And they guessed it. And they guessed even the, the, the appellation in Burgundy, you know, and I'm so excited that you do, and you did as well. That shows me how exciting it is to taste wine together. And for me, you know, you all need to know when I love going through this book, but I love tasting with Lisa when that moment once a year comes in. I'm excited because I'm going to learn. And I think, again, I want to repeat this. The idea of learning is what is so thrilling in wine, because as you make wine, you always want to push yourself to the next level. What is the next level? And Lisa, before we go to one of my favorite sentences in your book, tell us a little bit about what you mean by length, nature, and or finish. Ah, the length and nature of, of length and the finish. And the finish. Well, uh, basically, I mean, it's it's really simple, actually. It's it's, it's when we talk about finish, when we talk about length, yes. it's, it's how long the flavors last yes. on your palate. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I, Bob, Bob Parker, or I should say Robert Parker, who's our, our namesake, um, he used to actually sometimes take out a watch and measure it in minutes to see how long. He's um, right. But really it's about, you know, uh, seeing how long it actually lasts on there. And when I talk about nature of finish, it's not enough to maybe, you know, just be tasting some acid or some tannins or, you know, even maybe one simple, you know, fruity note on there. Um, what I like when you've got a really great wine is the layers that come through on I the see. finish. Mm -hmm. um, so that you're, you're tasting one thing in, or, or, or a group of things in the mid palate. Yes. And then you have new things coming through on the finish as well, maybe as spiciness that you didn't pick up before, minerality that you didn't pick up before. And I mentioned those things because um, when, I'm, when I'm tasting red wines, it's often, you know, those things that kind of maybe 
a particular a young wine might be a little bit hidden yes um, within all of the fruit in the mid palate um, but on the finish they actually just come out and they just sort of linger there a very long time and um, uh, that that's for me is, is is a really great finish and that's your sequence length and finish yeah. and you measure it too like him with a watch I don't know <laughs> <laughs> now another chapter I'm a big fan of which I and you mentioned a quote from Plato one of our all-time favorite uh, philosopher that is about balance mm. so maybe as we taste the next wine maybe let's taste a blend again I purposely chose some wines that this has never tried before. So, you know, and this wine is a wine we make with our good friend John Legend, as an example. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we have a wine named LVE, and John really wanted to make a wine. We became friends, and then he said, and we said, let's do it. So we created this, and we really made it together, which I love. And as you talk about balance, he's a very harmonious player, of the piano, very amazing singer, very seductive, charming, sophisticated. And the idea was to do that transformative wine that was all about balance. Mm. So maybe as you describe the wine, and maybe it's not yet balanced, it's a young wine, it's a 2018. And purposely it's not a $500 bottle of wine like often we taste together, $50. Ooh, that's nice. So. That's spicy. <laughs> yes. And Sorry. I got to say, Lisa is one of the experts as well. The first time I met her, she did that insane charismatic presentation about Australian wines. It was here in Napa. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's oh, the first time say. we met and I attended and I purposely wanted to attend because I'm not knowledgeable at all about that part of the world. And I was here to learn and I took five pages of notes which I love to do. I take notes and I learn a great deal. And so I chose this wine because maybe it makes you think of some great varieties from that place. Oh, okay. Um, what I love, and, and balance is it really, it talks about the complete sensation on the palate. So it's yeah. basically about all of the components in the wine existing in harmony so that no single component is sort of standing out yes. or above any of the others. Um, you don't want any edges to the wine. Um, everything should just be, well, I hate to use the word smooth, but you know, it's a, it's a great word I think to use when you're talking about yep. harmony. Um, you know, no edges, everything is, um, exists in a sort of relation to each other so that nothing's vying for attention. So for example, if you've got a wine that's over oaked yes and that's all you smell and all you taste and then you've got maybe the fruit in the background but it's really a, not a very pleasant experience because the oak is out of balance or if you've got a wine that's too tannic so it's like really hard in the mouth and really astringent and you feel like this sort of drying puckering sensation that's it and and maybe even a, a bit bitter as well because if tannins aren't ripe then they can be a little bitter or a wine that's just so acidic, it just makes you, you know, it feels like you're, you're you know, drinking lemon juice without any sugar in it. Um, so really what we're looking for is everything to be, you know, kind of seamless. That's right. You know, like you're, you're looking at a very fine dress or suit and you can't see the seams or anything, yes. but everything's like so intricate. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's really what you're looking for. So when you, when you taste this wine, um, what I love about it on the palate is, yeah, it's, it's smooth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Because you don't have acid standing out. You don't have tannins. Tannins are so soft and plush. And you know what? What I'm always looking for is the structure meeting the flesh, basically. So think that you've got like a, a skeleton. Um, and, and you put in flesh on that skeleton, basically yes. it just needs to perfectly fill out the flesh basically. So the, yeah. the flesh here is the fruit and the skeleton is the acid and the tannins. And so the fruit and the acid and the tannins all have to work together so mm -hmm. that you don't got, you the don't fruit, have a, the acid and the tannins. 
Yeah, you don't want to have too much flesh That's with no right. backbone, and you don't want to have a, what I, we call a skeletal wine, um, which has you know no flesh, but it's all acid and tannins. Um, really, you just want the, the, the feeling that you've got something that's complete there. Um, and this is exactly what you've got. You've got a generous amount of fruit. You've got good amount of tannins, but they're very ripe. They're very soft. They're just contributing a beautiful texture to the wine. And you've got just enough acid there to lift the richness John is going to give you a big kiss when you see him because <laughs> he was really actually very much part of it. We were in the red room at Raymond making the wine and we, we drank too much that day. Him specifically because he <laughs> loves to swallow the wines to evaluate it and he would love what you've said. Very nice. Very nice. Talking about balance. So there's another sentence I want to read you. Page 86, dear friends, when you get the book, I marked it last night. And I love it. And I need, I'm going to read it. And I'm going to give you the pitch line and I want you to tell us about it. Indeed, as with so many facets of life, the golden mean is an ideal median point that lies between that which is too much and that which is not enough. In other words, when it comes to wine, bigger isn't necessarily better. And I'm so glad you wrote this mm. for two reasons. One, because it's your era to lead the wine advocate, which I'm thrilled. And it's an evolution in Napa Valley, in Bordeaux, in Burgundy, in the world of wine. It's your era. And I'll say why. In many ways, people thought historically that Parker, who we love, Mr. Parker and the wine advocate was all about big, heavy, tannic wines. And as you know, we talked about the Parkerization mm. of wine. So I would love your comments on all that. Oh, I... Because I admire you writing this within the context you in. Well, you know, I think, I think, you know, Bob Parker got, a, you know, a bit of a reputation for liking these big, rich, bold wines. Um, and I, I think it was a little bit unfair because yeah. he loved elegant wines as well. He loved wines That's with right. a lot of freshness and all of that. Um, what he was championing was wines that, you know, were not skeletal, um, that, that actually had some fruit, some yes. flavor, some layers in them. Um, and, you know, you, you have to remember, he, he started out in an era where, you know, people maybe valued things like the 1855 classification a little bit too much That's so right. that you know you couldn't really touch the first gross or, or the super seconds it, you know they were just like gods you know no matter how bad the wine was you know no matter right. how you know underripe it was or, or skinny um, and so really he was he was you know trying to bring in this era where okay let's talk about this yes Let's talk about, you know, this, this, this wine is terrible, you know, and it's not going to get better. You know, it's, it. it tastes bad now and it's not going to get better in 20 years because that used to be the old thing that people would say, you know, oh, it's, it's too tannic now and, or it's, you know, give it 20 years and it will be beautiful. And, and often most of the time it won't. Yeah. And so he was, he was, you know, rightly angry about this. And this is why he wanted to be the consumer advocate. Um, but, you know, I think that what I was... Uh, what I'm trying to say there is that, you know, now we've got a much broader world of wines yes. that we're addressing, a very big world of wine and a very big group of consumers out there. And so, you know, we as critics, we, we can't have our stylistic preferences showing through in our reviews. Greatness can exist amongst many styles. That's right. Many styles of wine. And you need Great to... Great sentence. Great nets can exist among many styles. I love how you say that. Yes, and, and you need to have a very clear idea in your head what greatness is for each of those styles, yes. not just for one style or a couple of styles, all of those styles. Yes. Um, and so, but you also need to know what a terrible wine is as well, what, what you know is not good. And, and it's and important call to out. call it. Yeah. It's essential to call it. So I think, you know, when we, we are, are looking at wine quality, that is exactly what we're trying to call out, basically, is, yes, this is a great example of this 
more lighter bodied, elegant, perfume style. And this is also a great example of this rich, bold, robust style of wine. And, you know, both can have the same score if they're great examples, you know? That's it's, right. Uh, well, on that note, um, before we go to one of my favorite chapter, and dear friends, you realize I jumped 90 pages purposely because you got to get the book. That's a must. <laughs> We could be here all day talking about that. <laughs> well, and it's... <laughs> the way I talk. <laughs> you, you're going to get so many great ideas on how to look at wine. You've got to realize, I've been tasting wine since I'm five years old. And I read this book and read it again and learned a great deal. And why I'm excited, and this is why I called Lisa and said, would you please accept to be on the show again so we can talk about the book in depth so our friends around the world can desacralize the world of critics, can democratize their judgment, can feel comfortable about analyzing wine in their own way, and use Lisa beautiful words as a guideline because she makes it very easy and it's written with great depth and incredible understanding from the evaluation standpoint. We're not talking here about winemaking, even though she was enlightening on whole cluster versus not the whole cluster, and California versus Burgundy, which was great. So one area I'd love for you to explain, Lisa, is how does wine speak to you? Because we could feel the voice as you describe wine. We could feel you building a rapport, a relationship. What is so cool when you taste with Lisa is she's building a conversation with each of those wines. She hears your story, but she's building her story. Hmm. I think that's a good way of describing it. You know, it, it is. I mean, wine, when you really have um, an opportunity to look at it closely enough, it, it, it does have its own personality. It does have its own signature. Um, it does speak to you. Um, and it speaks to you in a, in a language of... of scent and flavor you know and all of these have a certain combination yes um they tell you for example you know the age of the wine they tell you where it's from you know and these are all things that i had to do when i was doing my master of wine you're given a blind tasting and you have to you know blind be able to tell you know um what country it's from what region it's from what grape variety is how it was made what the quality yes. level is all of these things and so you know, it's it's not kind of trickery. It's it's there in the glass. It's it's a, a code almost that's written yes. in scents and in and smells and in flavors. Um, and so, you know, you really get to know the wine because it's speaking of the, its vintage yes. when it was made. The growing season was it hot? Was it under stress? Was it did it have a nice easy breezy time through the growing season? It, the wine tells you all of these things that's right and it also tells you about what the winemaker did to it you know did they leave it in oak for too long did they oxidize it yeah um did they let you know Britannomyces get in there it you know it, it tells you all of these things it also tells you about the winemaker's vision yeah because the winemaker it's, it's like shaping a child that's it um and saying you and know, that's the fun part of what we do absolutely. there's a message in the bottle each time mm-hmm and as you said so well, there's an intention. There is an intention, yes. I mean, I think that, you know, when we get to the pinnacles of what wine is and what it can do, it's, it's really uh, capturing history in a glass. You I know? love that. And, and you know, as, as you know, some wines um, can last, you know, 100 years or more. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, it, it evolves, it grows, it changes, but it, the message is still there. Um, and you can see it, you know, you, you taste a 61 Bordeaux and you, you have that blind. Yes. You know it's 61 Bordeaux, no matter what the year and is. And why is that as an example, <laughs> 61? Well, you know, because it's, it's such an Because, you know, I haven't year. tasted many 61 Bordeaux. <laughs> I want to learn. It's an evocative year, you know. Yes. It speaks of a, a warm vintage of a, a richness a depth that is was uncommon to bordeaux back in those days even. i see 
Um, and, you know, the, the aging ability of some of those top wines, when you, you look at them, you, you, you put your nose in the glass and you're, you're, you're weighing up, okay, uh, this wine is really old, I can tell by this, this, and this, um, but, you know, what could it be? That's it. You know, it's so ripe, it's so rich, and it's looking youthful as well, because there's still primary fruit intermingled with all of these tertiary characters that are going on there. You know, and you boom, before you know it, you funneled your way into, oh, it could only be, <laughs> you know, so. So by a process of elimination, in a sense? Yeah, yeah, it's detective work almost. Yes. You know, you're going, okay, what, and you're just picking out all of these little aromas and flavors in there and saying, okay, that means that, and that means that, and that means that, because they all do equate to something. And so, you know, coming back to my original statement, when we use words like blackberries or cassis or um, plums, you know, we don't use them in your... Lightly. Yeah, we don't. We don't, we don't just toss them out there yes. um, for, for a red wine. They, they actually are linked to something, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a region or whether it's the grape variety or the blend. Um, they all, it all means something. Hmm. So I served you a last wine. Oh, okay. And there's history in the bottle. This is Chateau Buena Vista, dear friends. Ooh, Napa nice. Valley Cabernet. And I want to read you page 151, one of my favorite chapter. And I'd love for you to touch on it. And mm -hmm. it's not because it's a burgundy picture of Chambertin uh. Codobez. <laughs> Imagine that a wine expert, maybe a master of wine, me, perhaps, is driving through Burgundy. Is an imaginary township somewhere north of Nuit Saint-Georges and south of Gevray, and I'm driving down a desolate country road of the Route Nationale and stumble across a beautiful, wind tented vineyard poised mid-slopes on a limestone outcropping faces southeast and planted to Pinot Noir. And then Lisa proceeds to an amazing description of the vigneron, the sites, the techniques. And then it's an amazing description. And I won't read it to you because you're going to have to get the book. And it's about wine zen. And I love that expression. I'm going to use it, borrow it from you if you don't <laughs> mind. Because, you know, we use a lot from the Asian, the umami feel, which is the plenitude, the ultimate you know, wine is umami, it's kind of, oh, you know, you lay naked, <laughs> arm and leg spread, you look at the sun and you say, I'm there, right? And I love this chapter. So as we taste this wine, which is all about the history of Napa Valley and California and America, the first winery, and Lisa has never tried this wine. I don't believe you have. Tell us. I might have reviewed it. <laughs> oh, you may. You, well, maybe I did not know my homework, which is often possible, but I want <laughs> us to be very in the moment. And I'd love for us to tell you about what you mean by wine zen and that whole chapter for people to really get engaged in it. Well, I just, it's coming towards the, the, the end of the book, um, but I didn't want to leave the book or, or people um, with this sense, uh, this very technical sense that came you yes. know, in the, the opening chapters of the book, um, where I, I use a lot of technical terms and get you know into the nitty gritty of things, um, and talking about you know describing wines in technical terms. But I think that you know you can miss the point sometimes yeah. um, by only analyzing a wine in terms of the the technical attributes of it um, because wines you know they they have at those pinnacles of greatness again a magic something else um, and this is what you know drives people to love wine um, and the the little allegory that i wrote there um, was really about you know a, a technical taster you know stopping off at this unknown property in Burgundy and tasting the most incredible wine yes. and coming out with all of these technical terms and phrases um, to say to the vigneron um, about the wine and the vigneron, you know, it turns and says, you, you can't have this wine because you don't understand it. Hmm. 
Um, and, and this is it, you know, that, that, you, you know, understanding it is, is also about knowing that you can't really understand That's it. That's right. You know, that there is a, a certain magic something about wines. That um, je ne sais quoi. And, you know, it's, and it, people will, you know, poo-poo that and go, oh, you know, they'll all, you know, that's this marketing. Um, but it, yeah. it's not really. This is why we all fall in love with wine. It, yeah. it is absolutely why every single person falls in love with wine, because there is something about a wine at some point that makes each and every one of us stop. And, you know, we just can't explain what it is, um, but it's just so edifying, you know, mm. that you, you feel transported. Um, it's, it's an inexplicable experience. And, and experiences like that, you, you can't convey to somebody. They just, that's they, right. it just is. Um, and so that, that's the, the point I, I wanted. I didn't want this book to come across as being too technical in the, as much to say that I don't get wine. That's because right. I think that there comes a point where we need to be humble and say that, you know, we can't understand and and convey everything that there is to know about wine with numbers and yes. technical terms and you know scores and all of that there, there's you know uh an element that that's intangible what a powerful explanation you got a replay here stop <laughs> it well to history of yeah. America. so we're trying in napa valley very historical, to your point. Very historical mm. winery, the first. And that's the latest vintage, 2018. So very young, your friends. I love the 18s, you know. And I think that this is a great example of an 18 because it's got this brightness to it, this energy. You know, there's a mm. real sort of pop of freshness to the wine, isn't there? Wow. I love it. It's not, you know. If you say it, it sounds better than I do. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I think that a lot of consumers, you know, think of Napa and they think big, rich, you know, yeah. Uber, you know, cabs and things like that. But, the, the, you know, what I love about this wine is it's, it's, you know, kind of defies that. I mean, it's, it's, it's got intensity, it's got weight, it's got, you know, nice ripe tannins and everything that you expect from a really great Cabernet, but it's got that, that energy and that freshness as well, you know. Thank that, you. I love the fact that using my favorite word in the world, yeah. no entire world is energy. <laughs> So, well, thank you for that description. This is the Buena Vista. And you know what I love? It's a $50 bottle of wine. Because a lot of you have the perception that Lisa only talks about wine that are extremely pricey or just for the collectors. Maybe you explain that, Lisa, as far as the wine advocate, that you just don't review, a, you know, very pricey wine. Oh, no, we... we Review them all. <laughs> In fact, you know, our holy grail is to find a wine, a really good value wine that punches well above its weight. You know, these, these are the, the icons of yeah. the future. You see, that's maybe $50 is maybe the price one. I mean, we do a lot of... All wines start out at a humble price and then, you know, they get a reputation, they get scores, um, and yeah. <laughs> the price rockets. But, you know, part of what we do is we want to, you know, say to consumers... Oh, you know, this, this is a bargain, you know, yes. this, you need to hop on this now because in five years time, well, it's going to be through the roof. So you'd you better know, so. hop your friends. <laughs> um, quick question on the appendix, which I love. Mm -hmm. I'm an enormous fan, as many of you know, of Asian food. And was it because you were living in Asia as you started? It did. You know, actually, I kind of tacked that on because I had it. Um, uh, I, it's something that when I was living in Japan and Singapore, I started working on. Yeah. One of the first things I do when I go to a, a foreign country that I haven't been to before is I try to go to the market um, or, or, or a big market, a big wet market, and, and um, uh, check out the local produce. Yes. See what people are eating, smelling it, and tasting it. So that when you're talking about wine, you can describe it in terms that they'll actually understand. You know, uh, in, in Asia, well, Southeast Asia, for example, there's very few black fruits. It can be very, very difficult. I remember yes. once um, actually buying some black currant pastels from Europe, you know, little candies, yes. and bringing them 
to a class that I was teaching in Thailand um, because the students had never, ever tasted blackcurrant or smelled it before. So what I love about this chapter, dear friend, I wanted to highlight it for you because, you know, specifically in America, the world of Asian food is booming. I say specifically, but France has been booming for a long time. Lisa talks about cardamom, coriander, cumin, Chinese steam bread as well. She talks about curry leaves. She talks about mulberry. She talks about mango. You know, you could think mango antinomic to wine, but it's not. She talks about jasmine, khaki. You know, a lot of things that you, you know, turmeric, you know, we all love turmeric. She talks about it very well with that vibrant yellow colored spice as the staple, of course, of the curry family. She does it very well. She talks about yuzu, winter melon, and all those things work with wine. Yeah, no, well, it, and, and really it's just um, uh, being able to use them as descriptors as well. Um, they're, they're, you know, um, common smells that you can actually find in That's wine. That's right. Because what wine is all about, you know, and, and I think newbies to wine can find this a, a, a tough concept to, um, to get their heads around. But wine is basically sharing the same aroma and flavor compounds as lots of fruits and spices out there. Yes. Um, they, they're, they're the exact same compounds. I remember, you know, once having an argument with a woman um, about a Sauvignon Blanc that had like, you know, bell pepper smell. And she said, no, they've put bell peppers in here. <laughs> they have put bell peppers. And I said, no, no, it's pyrazines. See, bell peppers have pyrazines. Sauvignon Blanc has pyrazines. <laughs> the same. I think you said she should rank <laughs> fragrance as well. Yeah. I would love and you to could. do that. I would love to do that. It's amazing. So, Lisa, I want to give you another invitation on our show whenever you want. Absolutely. I love it. Well, thank you. You know I love talking about wine. Well, and you're so amazing and you're making it so accessible. I know everybody's going crazy. I'd love one day, whenever you decide, and we're in the spring, it could be the summer, it could be whenever is appropriate for your busy schedule, is to show us maybe, which I love on page 160, and I want to talk about it now because it deserves a whole 40 minutes or half an hour, whatever time we need, to talk about scoreboards as far mm -hmm. as how you dive into the world of analyzing a wine that could potentially be that wine that from appearance to color to aroma to bouquet to the ascent to the descent to the acidity to the length to everything on how you do it. So if you accept to do it. I will, yeah, we'll talk about wine scoring next time. Yes, because dear friends, there's a methodology that I've seen and witnessed that I borrowed from Lisa. She explained me, just probably six years ago when we tasted together. And for me, I've been tasting for 45 years. You gotta realize I've been into this world of assessing our own wines, other people's wine. You have so many methods from the old world to the Burgundian old boys and girls to... Well, you grew up with a test fun. That's it, <laughs> with the actual cup, and we'll show you how it works. So, uh, rendezvous very soon with Lisa Perotti. Dear friends, wrote this amazing book that she can witness. I read many times. <laughs> I, I'm now convinced you read it. Yeah, she was a little skeptical. <laughs> I was like, you didn't read it. Yeah, <laughs> she was skeptical. And you know, I have another copy that I circle because I'm a highlighter. You know, I'm an old school type of I do reader. Yeah. You know, I take notes. That's why I had my page here and I highlight. And I love it because, well, I'm honored because I really want to thank you, Lisa, tonight for being with us. And, you know, I have tears in my eyes because I learned so much. I'm electrified for all of you because you got the opportunity which never happens. I met Lisa on a seminar. We were 100 <laughs> packed in that room. It was about Australian wines, remember? Yeah. I came to see you at the end and I said, this is my card. I'd love to meet you again. <laughs> and so kindly we, we, we connected this way. And it was through something I did not know. And I was enlightened and I was energized. You use that word and you have that talent oh, through thanks. your words and through the book. So dear friends, thank you. Rendezvous in the summer.
Yeah. With the famous Lisa Perotti wine advocate and tastes like Lisa Perotti. <laughs> and now, dear friends, we're so fortunate because we have our ladies. <laughs> And they are with us. The dinner is about to start. And I have a big question to Lisa. How early should we have our ladies learn about wine? Well, you know, it's, it's a good question because obviously my, my two daughters, um, this is the, the youngest one, um, they uh, smell wine now and they go, ooh, it smells like wine. <laughs> um, but what I have been doing pretty much since they can walk and talk is taking them in the kitchen and showing them spices, showing them things like flowers in the garden, so yes. lavender, cloves, lemon oil, any any you know um, simple fragrances, and getting them to isolate and be able to name that fragrance. Um, and I'm always impressed. You know, we, we'll walk into a, a hotel room or something, for example, and one of them will shout, "Oh, I smell lavender!" You know, and because it it really works. You know, it's like learning a language. Um, at a very young age. Um, and because young children are so geared, yes. so much more geared, I should say, than, than adults at learning languages, um, it, it's exactly the same with, you know, building up an aroma library. Um, so I think, you know, starting them young, just on... on so should, talking about that, forgive me, shall we have them describe the nose? Yeah, do you want to smell a wine, Scarlett, here? What does it smell like? <laughs> Can well, you tell me what it smells like? That was a great. Thank you for giving a thumbs up. <laughs> Can you tell me if it, it, what fruit does that smell like? Smell like any fruits? It smells like plum, blackberry. You're okay, that's good. a start. What about you? Do you smell anything? Hmm. I smell like blackberry. Yes! Oh, well, that's a good one. Good. That's very black. Yeah. So we learn from our children at all time, right, ladies? Mm -hmm. And are the ladies the future of wine palettes? Because I, <laughs> I'm excited to say that ladies in general taste amazing. Right? They do. And part of it has to do with that. You know, there's, um, you know, now it's probably a lot more mixing than before, but it used to be traditional for, for moms to take the girls into the kitchen and, you know, again, show yeah. them the spices, show them the cooking and things like that. And so, you know, women, you know, inadvertently started working up a really great aroma library from a very young age. Um, so and I think that has a lot to do with it. So we should all be in the kitchen. Yes, we should all be in the kitchen. So dear friends, we're <laughs> in, the in the kitchen <laughs> and in the garden. Lisa, isn't it exciting Jeez. to the next Generation, the future wine palettes of the world. Ladies, we had so much fun. To very soon, we're coming back this summer with Lisa Perotti. Cheers. <laughs>